All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, again, we're going to be talking about Chicano and Mexican-American rights today, just continuing the lecture from last week, or Wednesday. Uh, so we're going to talk about a few people here. The first person you guys should be aware of is Cesar Chavez. Cesar Chavez did fight for uh, Mexican-American rights, but in particular, uh, he created an organization to fight for farm workers' rights. He tried to improve... Uh, working conditions for farmers, that organization is called the UFW, or the United Farm Workers Union. This down here is the UFW logo. All right, there's, whoops, there's a UFW logo. Again, in the UFW, or United Farm Workers Union, he was just fighting to improve working conditions for farmers. That's the basic idea, fighting to improve the working conditions of farmers. Uh, interestingly enough, though, uh, he was working with both uh, right, trying to improve uh, conditions for farmers and Filipinos, since many of the farmers back then were Filipinos and Mexican at the time. Uh, furthermore, uh, there's another organization called La Raza Unida. La Raza Unida. And the group La Raza Unida uh, was an organization uh, that was intended to encourage Latino voting. It was, in, it was designed to encourage Latino voting, or supposed to encourage Latinos to vote. So it encouraged Latino voting. Cool. Encouraged Latino voting. Questions there? All right. Then you have the first gay rights movement, the beginning of the gay rights movement. This is pretty prominent uh, in America today, which had the gay rights movement beginning at this time. And the gay rights movement really begins at the Stonewall Inn riot. Uh, what happened uh, in the Stonewall Inn riot, uh, what year was this? Uh, in 1969, uh, was that the Stonewall Inn was a pretty popular place in New York where gays were accepted. Okay, uh, most of New York, and most of the country, uh, was not very accepting of openly gay homosexuals. Uh, and so the Stonewall Inn was pretty tolerant. You know, the, a lot of uh, gays attended, transvestites, what have you, uh, transgender folks. Um, and what would happen is that they would be harassed, beaten by police, uh, whatever else. And so what happened, and the what caused the Stonewall Inn riot, uh, was that uh, a gay man was beaten by off-duty police officers. A gay man was beaten by off-duty police officers. And as a result, there was a riot. I mean, uh, did they have enough? You know, just like with whites, where they, uh, blacks, where they're being oppressed, uh, gay Americans were also being harassed by other Americans. And so a riot began. This is the first time that uh, the gay movement really stands up and says, no, we're not going to take it anymore. So the gay rights movement uh, begins at the Stonewall in riot. Um, eventually, you'll have people like Harvey Milk become one of the first openly gay politicians, but we'll talk about that stuff later, later. But yeah. Questions there? None? Okay. Then the culture of the 1960s, the counterculture of the 1960s. So here's an image of one group that's part of the counterculture of the 1960s. Um, are they conformists? Definitely not. These are the non-conformists. These are definitely non-conformists. And they were inspired by uh, what group of the 1950s? The beatniks. So they're heavily inspired by the beatniks of the 1950s. But these are the uh, non-conformists of the 1960s. Uh, many of these people uh, will try to fight uh, for peace. Uh, many of them are fighting for peace. Uh, they're trying to fight for civil rights. They're fighting for peace, fighting for civil rights. A lot of these are teen rebellions or teen rebels, you know, trying to fight back. They're opposed to the clean teen, that kind of thing. They're nonconformists, fighting for peace, fighting for civil rights. Uh, and so this group in particular is which group? Of the, these are the hippies, right? The H-I-P-P-I-E-S, the hippie movement. Let's be familiar, the hippies are just one part of the counterculture movement. We'll get back to them in just a sec. Well, uh, some of the people that did begin protesting are people like the Students for a Democratic Society, or SDS. Students for a Democratic Society, or SDA, or SDS. 
And Students for a Democratic Society, or SDS, was run by a man named Tom Hayden. Tom Hayden. And Tom Hayden, the leader, said that students should be more involved in university decisions. Students should be more involved in university decisions. So again, SDS, Students for a Democratic Society, uh, led by Tom Hayden, argued that students should be more involved in university decisions. Uh, the basic idea was if we were going to hire professors or a new president for the university, uh, before the professors would just make that choice, or maybe the board would make that choice. But would the students be affected by the hiring of different professors? Sure. And so the students said, why don't we get to voice our opinion in that decision-making process? And so they said, yeah, you know, students should have more voice. And so you know how today we have like a ASB, associate student body. Technically, uh, that group is supposed to make decisions on your behalf. Otherwise, if we didn't have ASB, especially at the high school level, uh, it would be likely that, you know, the Miss Smalley and I would choose prom for you. We would just decide what the theme would be. It would be like, uh, let's do World War II. That'll be the theme for prom. Let's do McCarthyism. That'll be the next year's prom theme. That kind of stuff. You know, I will decide. It'll be all academic. We would decide dress code. We would decide what you guys would wear. And so do you think it's good to have some student input there? Definitely. That begins at the college level and it slowly trickles down to the high school level. You guys clearly don't have as much power in like hiring, for example. But in college, if you hire a new professor, uh, you'll have an uh, administrator, you'll have a, another professor, and then you'll have a student sit on a panel that interviews potential uh, professors at that school. So does that give students a lot more power there? Yeah, the idea is you as students should be more involved, and college is a really great way to participate. ASB uh, at this school is also one way to do that as well. By the way, applications for ASB will be available next week if you guys are interested in applying. So, putting that out there. Uh, anyway, free speech movement uh, was another part of the new left student movement. And just the basic idea behind the free speech movement is that students should be allowed to protest openly on college campuses. Students should be allowed to protest or campaign on college campuses. Students should be allowed to protest or campaign on college campuses because you know, they're angry about stuff. And so you know, they should be allowed to protest about you know, the uh, Vietnam War or protest about civil rights. And colleges said, no, this is a place of learning. You shouldn't be protesting here. You're going to disrupt the academic learning environment. But students said, if we're not going to protest here, then when should we protest? Shouldn't we have the right to protest on college campuses? I mean, this is the best place to do it. And so again, that kind of is promoted, and students now have a right to vote, uh, not vote, uh, protest on college campuses. Hypothetically, I guess you guys have the right to protest at this school too, but it's not like you guys have anything really to protest about. Now, there's nothing really, really horrible at this school. Actually, your school's pretty good. There's really, there's very, very few things that are really awful. And even then, I can't really think of anything that's awful at the school. Um, so I mean, I mean, oh, school lunch is not so good. We should walk out. Uh, I think that's a very good reason to do a walkout. You're really uh, making these things look like you know, they're on the same level. So I think, you know, if one school walks out because they're opposed to gun violence, and then you guys walk out because you don't like school lunches, it's kind of unfair to say you guys are on the same level there. So I wouldn't waste your walkout on dumb things. Anyway. This is an example of anti-Vietnam War protests. Uh, but again, uh, they're just protesting Vietnam, protesting for civil rights, that kind of thing. Uh, and this is all made possible because of the free speech movement. Cool. Awesome. All right. Uh, the counterculture movement is also inspired by music, definitely inspired by music. Uh, one of the more famous musicians of this time is Bob Dylan. What do you got for us, Bob? Well, Mr. King, I got a song for you. Remember, this is the 1960s, so there are hippies at this time. Can you imagine hippies kind of like just holding flowers in their hands and just kind of listening to music and hoping for civil rights and ending the war? I mean, it's kind of the same idea. You know, they're trying to get people to love and be happy and love thy neighbor. So 
So it's supposed to be calming. You know, you just, you just want to be peaceful. You want to end the war, civil rights, nonviolent resistance. You know, peace, man. Let's all just be cool. So that's Bob Dylan. Other really famous uh, artists at this time promoting this uh, hippie, nonviolent, you know, music is everything uh, movement is Joan Baez. Pete Seeger and Janis Joplin, so there's other famous musicians at this time promoting this non-violent, peaceful movement, are these three. Uh, so these three individuals are also part of this uh, hippie movement of sorts, this non-violence movement. Another famous group, of course, you guys know is the Beatles. The Beatles are not exactly the same as the uh, Bob Dylans of the time. They're more pop culture, but uh, they will change. But obviously, the Beatles are still part of that teen rebellion. Remember that that social rebellion. Uh, the Elvis Presleys are inspired by that as well. And so, this is all part of that young teen rebellion. Here's some Beatles. Have a lot of that going. Um, uh, and then, of course, uh, the culmination of the 1960s counterculture movement is Woodstock. Woodstock happened in New York in 1969. And Woodstock uh, was the culmination, like I said, uh, three days of peace and music. Uh, I would argue uh, that the unofficial slogan of uh, Woodstock was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It was three days of sex, drug, and sex, drugs, and rock and roll or peace and free love and a lot of drugs. But that's really what it was. I mean, it was sex, drugs, and rock and roll, free love, peace, and a lot of drugs. Um, because folks, I mean, a lot of these people were just like, you know, we like music, we like listening to our favorite artists, so let's create a music festival. The music festival, I think, was, I mean, I don't know the exact numbers, but I'm gonna give you guys an idea of how bad it was. Supposed to be really good. And what happened was that, uh, assuming that they had planned this festival for about 10,000 people, over 100,000 people showed up. It was way more than they anticipated. And so cars were parked all along the city of Silver Lake, New York. And, like, and for miles, you had to park really far away and then walk all the way to the, fest, uh, the concert uh, area. And then like, they only had porta potties for like 10,000 people, but there was like 100,000 people there. So the porta potties overflowed, then they got overused, and they just began seeping on the floor. But like, no one really cared because they were all high. And then like, you know how people are like, dancing in the mud and everything? That's not all mud, guys. <laughs> that you guys know right now uh, they were it was raining and so like you know the feces got to roll over the water in a pool you're like oh let's dance in the mud and like yeah you're gonna get hepatitis c man you're gonna you're gonna get a contracted disease and then they're all dirty and muddy and everyone's having sex because you know that's just what happened here and then people were naked all over the place doing a lot of drugs and that was uh that was woodstock it was kind of the culminating you know hippie movement uh, the headliner of this sex, drugs, and rock and roll festival uh, was Jimi Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix, J-I-M-I. Jimi Hendrix, J-I-M-I. Hendrix, H-E-N-D-R-I-X. Jimi Hendrix. It will end. And why will the counterculture end? Why does the counterculture and the hippie movement end, folks? Because they got older. I mean, the reality is they got older. And so why does the counterculture end? They grew older. Again, folks, the music that I liked back then, I don't like as much today. I'm like, wow, that music was really loud back then. I mean, I'm not that much older than you guys. I'm only 27. And yet, I'll listen to, like, you know, the radio now. I'm like, why is your music so loud? Why do you listen to this kind of music? And then, like, why can't you just listen to National Public Radio? I like that thrift shop song, though. <laughs> it's catchy. Um, but it's quiet. It's not yelling or anything. It's, like, very quiet, monotone. Anyway, other reasons why uh, the counterculture ends, uh, they have children. Many of them that were shocked by this, but they shouldn't have been since they were just sleeping around all the time at Woodstock. Like, what, I have kids? Oh, that's right, some with like 30 guys at Woodstock. That's probably, who's the father? So, so that becomes a problem. So you know, they have to have responsibility. Like, oh crap, responsibility, that's an issue. Uh, civil rights movement ended. I said, remember how we were fighting, we're fighting for civil rights? Is there anything to fight for anymore? I mean, they were protesting for civil rights. Now that it's over, what are you going to fight for? Hey, give those people civil rights. Oh, you gave it to them? Then I'll have a Coke. I'm really thirsty from yelling. Again, but there's nothing to fight about anymore. The Vietnam War ended. The Vietnam War ended. So again, they're protesting, protesting about ending the war in Vietnam. Hey, end the war in Vietnam and stop killing kids. Oh, you did? 
Ah! I'd like a t-shirt. And that's just the way it is. But it ends, and then so you have nothing to fight for. It's like, oh, well, we got what we wanted? Great! I'll go home now. That's it. Um, and lastly, folks, you need jobs. I mean, they're not going to be able to support their not doing anything for their entire lives. And so eventually these people need a job. Are they going to get hired dressed the way that they were? No. You know, they got to put on clothes, man. Put on shoes and comb your hair, take a shower, go to a job interview, that kind of stuff. And so, I mean, things changed. And uh, ultimately, uh, the counterculture does end. And uh, yeah. Maybe moving on. But again, uh, be aware, folks, this is like teen social rebellions of sorts. Just be aware. Uh, when we talk about, remember, conformity, non-conformity, definitely non-conformity. Uh, happy times, good times, definitely happy times, though. It's non-conformist happy times. It's weird. Anyway, there's that. Let's talk about the Warren court successes. So uh, remember Earl Warren? He was that uh, chief justice of the Supreme Court. What was his most famous Supreme Court case that we talked about previously? Brown v. Board. So Brown v. Board of Education. Again, of Topeka, Kansas, but Brown v. Board is usually good enough. Or Brown v. Board of Education. Uh, but Brown v. Board, uh, 1954, uh, was a significant Supreme Court case decision. Because what did this do? Who can tell me what Brown v. Board did? Raise your hand and tell me what Brown v. Board did. Yeah. It integrated schools and it overturned what Supreme Court case? Yeah. Plessy v. Ferguson. In what year? Did anyone know the year? What year was Plessy v. Ferguson? 1896. What year was Brown v. Board? 54. 1954. Okay, good. Other Supreme Court cases he passed, Gideon v. Wainwright. The Supreme Court case of Gideon v. Wainwright, Supreme Court ruled that you have the right to an attorney, even if you can't afford one. You have the right to an attorney even if you can't afford one. How many of you guys are aware of all of your rights if you are arrested? Does anyone know of all the rights you may or may not have if you're arrested and questioned? You might know some of them, but do you know all of them? No. And so what if you start answering questions you didn't know that you didn't have to answer them? Did you do it? Yes. Ah, I'm a no. Ah, if I only had an attorney, I would have known not to say that. So yeah, it's one of those things where having an attorney there you should have one if you need one. Secondly, Escobedo v. Illinois. This rule, you have the right to an attorney during questioning. So it's not just you have the right to an attorney when you're at trial. You also have the right to an attorney during questioning. Because the first one, Gideon v. Wainwright, is all about having an attorney to represent you like at the trial. But Escobedo v. Illinois is about having an attorney during questioning, you know? If they're asking you questions, they have to have an attorney there because anything you tell the police, can they use that during the trial? Yeah, so you should know what your rights are the second they start answering you, asking you questions. The third case then, Miranda v. Arizona. Hmm. Miranda v. Arizona said two things. You have the right to remain silent and you have the right to know your rights. You have the right to remain silent and you have the right to be informed of your rights. Because folks, it's all awesome and all to know that you have the right to an attorney, but what if you didn't know you had the right to an attorney? Wouldn't that be a problem? Like, oh, well, uh, you could have asked for an attorney. No one told me. Well, you were supposed to know. Why would I know that? Why would I know automatically I need to have an attorney? Why is that something that I should know? So again, issue. Anyway, uh, so Miranda becomes the... That's exactly why they have to read Miranda rights today. If they don't read your Miranda rights after they arrest you, uh, they can let you go. Because according to Miranda rights, you have the right to an attorney. Or sorry, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. So don't say anything. You have the right to an attorney. If you cannot afford one, one will be provided to you at no cost. Those are your Miranda rights. They have to read them to you. If you refuse to listen, it's also printed in the squad car while you're waiting to be driven to jail. So that way, when you are bored and you're waiting in the back of the police car, you can read it on your way over. But the basic idea, folks, is that you have to have your Miranda rights read to you. You can't just be arrested and say, so did you do it? They have to first of all inform you, you have the right to remain silent. Now, 
do you waive that right? I'm going to ask you some questions. You can choose to answer or not choose to answer. It's up to you. You can waive your rights at any time. You can start answering, but if you don't like the questions, you can say, you know what, I do want an attorney. And you can do that after. Anyway, uh, the Warren Court uh, really fought, if you want to summarize his Supreme Court cases, uh, the Warren Court fought for the rights of the individual. Well, he fought for civil rights, so let me put it. He fought for civil rights and rights of the accused. Let's put it that way. He fought for civil rights and the rights of the accused. He fought for civil rights and the rights of the accused. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. So President Johnson evaluated. Was he a good president, bad president? So we're going to play a game today called Bueno No Bueno. I'm trying to incorporate about, uh, make my class at least 0.1% bilingual. Every year is my new initiative. So we're going to play a game called Bueno No Bueno. We're going to go ahead and uh, list down all the things that Johnson did roughly, generally. And I'm going to ask you, is, he, is his administration bueno or no bueno? Cool. Here we go. He helped the poor and uneducated, and he also helped minorities. Very similar to what previous presidents? What previous presidents helped the poor and the minorities and the educated? What other presidents really known for helping the poor? Who? Oh, that's way too far. Like FDR, Truman, those presidents. I mean, they're the most recent. You know, it's, it's very New Deal esque, right? He was trying to help the poor. He was very compassionate to the poor and the educated. So does it show that uh, Johnson was bueno, no bueno? Bueno. Bueno, definitely. And the Great Society was a huge success. Very, very successful. Bueno, no bueno. Bueno. Examples of this uh, bueno ness? Uh, well, education. Right, Head Start, Upward Bound, do these programs still exist today? Yeah. Definitely. So bueno, no bueno. Bueno. What about health? Medicare, providing health for who? Right, health care for who? The elderly and the poor. And does Medicare still exist today? Sure, bueno, no bueno. Bueno, definitely bueno. Immigration. We passed the Immigration Act in 1965. We got rid of what previous system? Quota system. So more people are immigrating to America now. More people have access to America's freedoms and opportunities. Bueno, no bueno. Bueno. Civil rights. He passed things like the 24th Amendment to abolish what? Abolish what? 24th Amendment abolished what? What is it? Who can? Poll taxes. Also, Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, and that thing where we had to give preference to uh, minorities and women, what's that called? Yet when colleges and employers have to give priority hiring and uh, admission to minorities and women, what's that called? Affirmative action. Affirmative action, very good. So, Civil Rights, bueno, no bueno. Bueno. But of course, the war on poverty failed because did we, uh, did we make sure everyone was no longer poor? Unfortunately, this was something that we could not overcome. Bueno, no bueno. No bueno. He also expanded the size and role of government. So many people thought this was bueno because they like a government that gets involved. Uh, this means the government is not what? If the government is very involved, regulating a lot, then this government is not practicing what? Laissez-faire. Isn't that cool that you guys just know what that means now? It's like, oh, it seems very laissez-faire. I'm going to be a laissez-faire parent. Let's throw it around now, guys. I'm a non-intervening baron. Kids are doing drugs. Well, let's say fair, man. <laughs> let's say fair. Of course, uh, all these programs that we create, folks, are they going to be expensive? Yes. And who's going to have to pay for them? The government. Who's the government? Who's going to pay the government? Taxpayers. So people believe that's no bueno. Cool so far. Uh, that's a good thing. I mean, I would, I would argue that it is bueno. Uh, primarily just because, I mean, a lot of people felt that, you know, the government is caring for the poor, providing education services. I mean, it's always good to help the people. The problem is it costs money. They're like, I will build you a house. The problem is I don't have the money for the house. So that's it's not so great. Anyway, folks, Johnson overall, bueno, no bueno. bueno. Ultimately, bueno. Uh, yeah, we'll get to that. Now let's talk about the Vietnam War. 
We'll talk about the Vietnam War today. We'll talk about a little about the Vietnam War on Monday, and then on Wednesday we're going to watch a video on the Vietnam War. And then we'll uh, finish up, and like I said, we'll be done before spring break. It's all very exciting. And after that, test, and then test, and then study, and then test, and then essay, and then essay, and then test, and test an essay, and then essay test. And not more of those. One spring break. Never. <laughs> You're never going to get one. For you guys, never. You don't get a spring break. First week of April. First week of April. You will get spring break homework, guys, but I'll give it to you next week. So if you guys want to do it before spring break, then sure. But, I mean, on all honesty, folks, should you guys be studying during spring break? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, again, have a spring break, but you will have to study a little bit over spring break because you need to remember, it's 10 units you guys have to study. <laughs> Cumulative. So, yeah. Vietnam! So, just some background about Vietnam again. First off, who's Ho Chi Minh? Leader of uh, which Vietnam? North. North Vietnam. Leader of North Vietnam. And he is of what political... He's a communist, right? He's a communist. Um, now, a uh, few things about the uh, northern communist supporters. Uh, there are three terms you guys should know first. is the Viet Minh. The Viet Minh... That's the North Vietnamese Army. The Viet Minh is a North Vietnamese Army, sometimes known just as the NVA. The Viet Minh, NVA, North Vietnamese Army. Uh, they're the ones who fought the French uh, when they were a colonial power. Does that make sense to everyone? When they were still a colony, the Viet Minh are the ones who fought the French. Eventually, once North Vietnam becomes its own country, the Viet Minh whoops, become the NLF. They become the North National Liberation Front. So the Viet Minh, which is the North Vietnamese Army, or the NVA, becomes the National Liberation Front, and it becomes the official army of North Vietnam. Cool. Now the Viet Cong, on the other hand, those are Vietnamese communists. And typically the, North, uh, the Vietnamese communists, the VC, we call them VC or Charlie, what do you call them? Uh, the VC, they are secret communists in South Vietnam. They are secret communists in South Vietnam. Now, what's the problem with fighting a war against an idea versus fighting a war against a country? Yeah, you don't know who it is, right? You're fighting a war against Japan versus fighting a war against communists. I know who's Japanese. I don't know who's communist. So that's a problem. So in any case, uh, the Viet Cong are the secret communists in South Vietnam, and they're going to be a problem. Are these three groups going to work together to try to hurt the Americans in South Vietnam? Most definitely. And they're supported by China and Russia. By the way, this poster here uh, says, you know, we, we was victory in the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. Uh, and then Tang just means victory. That's not because I speak Vietnamese. That's just because I Googled it to make sure I didn't say any cuss words. And be like, F the French. <laughs> I'm like, I better double check this real quick. It's, it's very nice. It's like victory over, victory at Dien Bien Phu. I'm like, okay, cool. I can, I can put that. That's simple. Anyway, when Kennedy was president, uh, Vietnam uh, was led by No Dinh Diem. You guys remember him? No Dinh Diem was what kind of leader? He was a dictator, a military dictator, and we were okay with that because he was our military dictator. And we were okay with him being our military dictator because what was he doing for us? Stopping communism. And that's pretty cool. We're okay with that. He's trying to stop communism. So we're okay with that. In any case, uh, support No Dinh Diem there. Unfortunately, No Dinh Diem, again, is a military dictator. And what ends up happening uh, is that uh, he's very unpopular, so we have to send over 16,000 military advisors to support him because he's just not doing a very good job of controlling his government. And uh, he's having a really hard time fighting the VC and the North Vietnamese, so we have to support him with the 16,000 military advisors. Well, 
he becomes very unpopular after this event that's already featured here. This is when a monk did something called self-immolation. Or a monk performed self-immolation. What does that mean? He set himself on fire. The, his protest, he was protesting no din diem. And in his protest, he set himself on fire, which can be interpreted as I would rather set myself on fire than have another day in no Din Diem's regime. So, what does that suggest about no Din Diem's government? It was not good. If that guy's willing to set himself on fire, uh, your government must be terrible. And so his government was terrible. He became very, very unpopular. And is that good if uh, our leader, if the leader that we chose, our puppet leader, remains very unpopular. No, because does that make us look bad? It does. So for a while we tolerated it. But after this we're like, no way, we can't tolerate this anymore. So in November 1963, the CIA supported a coup of No Din Diem in South, in South Vietnam. What does a coup mean? What's a coup? Like a coup d'etat. You know what that means? What does coup mean in French? Coupé. Means to cut. Coup d'état, you guys know that term? Coup d'état literally means to cut off the head. It's a military overthrow. It's when you overthrow the government. So a coup d'état, or a coup d'état. Coup d'état just means to cut off the head in French, but it means uh, overthrow of the government. Coup d'état. And so in 1963, the U.S. supported a coup d'état in South Vietnam because do they have to replace No Din Diem? He's just not popular anymore. And we're okay with him dying. We're like we're cool with that. Get rid of him. You know, have him you know die by firing squad. Whatever. He needs to pay for his crimes, and we need a new leader that will support our ideals. Good so far. Okay. Kennedy dies, and Johnson's now in charge. Well, when Johnson's in charge after Kennedy dies, uh, Johnson. Uh, Johnson issues uh, something, uh, and so that becomes known as the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. Here's the background of the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. Johnson had announced that American ships were attacked by the North Vietnamese. American ships were attacked by the North Vietnamese. And the attack was unprovoked. So again, American ships were attacked by the North Vietnamese, and the attack was unprovoked, which means what? Yeah, we didn't attack them first. They just attacked us randomly. So the idea was, here we were just innocently sailing outside the, in the Gulf of Tonkin, right outside of North Vietnam, not attacking them, just making sure there's peace and no attacks and no whatever else, and then they attacked us. We're not even in the war, right? We're just helping South Vietnam. And they attacked us. Cold blood. Unprovoked. And so Johnson announces this to Congress. says, Congress, I need power to fight this war. So Congress gives him that power. And in 1964, Congress issues the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. In 1964, Congress issues the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, giving Johnson blank check powers to fight the Vietnam War. Giving Johnson blank check powers to fight the Vietnam War. What does that mean, blank check powers? He doesn't need their permission, and what can he do? Yeah, it's unlimited power. Unlimited finances. He's been given a blank check to fight a war. Pretty much what that means is Congress said, Go do whatever you need to. You're commander in chief. You don't have to ask for permission. Go and fight. Now, is Congress supposed to do that? Isn't Congress supposed to prove everything that the military does? I mean, yes, the president is commander in chief, but shouldn't Congress approve that budget every year? They're saying, no, forget it. Go ahead and do it. Go fight the war. Escalate if you need to. Do whatever you need to do to fight this war. Johnson said, thank you. And Johnson said, are you sure, by the way? I'm going to take this, but are you sure? He said, yeah, go ahead, fight the war. So Johnson is given blank check powers. But Johnson says, don't worry. 
I promise not to expand the war in Vietnam. I'm going to send in some planes to bomb North Vietnam, but I won't send in troops. I won't expand the war in Vietnam. With troops. Let's uh, make that clear. But he promises, I know you've given me unlimited power, but I won't abuse it. I will not send more troops to Vietnam. We're just going to airstrike Vietnam. Kill, kill as many communists as we can to help South Vietnam win this war. Good so far? Blank check powers. So again, the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution gave Johnson blank check powers. Everyone cool with that? Okay. So here's what he did with those blank check powers. In 1965, we begin Operation Rolling Thunder. Parts of Operation Rolling Thunder are known as Operation Niagara, but it's the same operation. What does Niagara mean, by the way? What is Niagara? Like Niagara Falls? What is that? It's a waterfall. Okay, so here's what happened under Operation Rolling Thunder and Operation Niagara. This was a three-year non-stop bombing raid of North Vietnam. Every day for three years, we bombed North Vietnam. Every day for three years. I mean, these are just examples of some planes just dropping bombs over North Vietnam. That's just, that's just what, seven of them. We did this every day throughout the day. We tried to bomb both North Vietnam and the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The Ho Chi Minh Trail, folks, was this trail right here. Uh, it was a trail used by North Vietnam to supply the Viet Cong in South Vietnam. So the Ho Chi Minh Trail was used to supply, uh, was used by North Vietnam to supply South Vietnamese Viet Cong. In any case, folks, we uh, dropped over 864,000 tons of bombs. To give you guys a uh, comparison, in World War II, we dropped about 550,000 in two fronts. And here we dropped 864,000 on one country. So just think about that for a second. Secondly, we killed over 90,000 North Vietnamese casualties, so high death toll. But again, we said, we're not going to expand the war, we're going to just bomb it. Unfortunately, the bombing was not very effective. I mean, yeah, we bombed a whole bunch of stuff, but we're bombing farms and we're bombing ra you know, ra uh, rails and train yards and whatever else, factories even, but it, it wasn't super effective. And so Johnson says, if we're going to win this war, what do we have to do? We're going to have to send in troops. I know I said we wouldn't, but we got to win this war. So in March 1965, he sends in 2,000 troops. And that's the beginning. By December 1965, he sends in 184,000. By 1966, 385,000. By 1967, 485,000. And by December 1968, 538,000 troops were in Vietnam. Did he escalate the war? Did he expand the war? Did he promise not to? Sure did. He broke that promise. Mentiroso. <laughs> He's a liar. Ho Chi Minh responds and says, sure, you can bring uh, as many as soldiers as you want, but you can kill ten of my men to one of yours, but even at those odds, you will lose and I will win. So Ho Chi Minh says, bring it. Bring as many soldiers as you want. I'm still going to win this war because I'm fighting a defensive war. I'm going to win this. Yeah, a lot of people in Vietnam. <coughs> a lot of people fighting in Vietnam. Have you, any of you guys fighting in Vietnam? Anyone here fighting in Vietnam? No? Yeah, just checking. You fight in Vietnam? Cool. Interesting. I went to Call of Duty. <laughs> nice. Uh, fighting in Vietnam. Uh, now, the v these soldiers fighting in Vietnam were led by General William Westmoreland. General William Westmoreland uh, led soldiers in the Vietnam War. So he was kind of the general of the Vietnam conflict. Uh, here he is made of wood. He was carved. That's him right there, carved by someone else in wood. Pretty impressive. 
Uh, in addition to all the fighting that we did perform, you know, s no search and destroy, all that stuff, uh, we did use two different chemicals to fight this war. The first was Agent Orange. Agent Orange was a defoliant. What is a defoliant? Yeah, we no. It's used to kill plants. We sprayed this defoliant over the jungles to kill the jungle. Why did we spray defoliants or Agent Orange over the jungles and farms? So that what? Yeah. Yeah, so they couldn't hide, right? Because they were hiding in the jungles. Ju Vietnam is all jungle. So they sprayed Agent Orange all over the jungles to destroy the jungles so that the Viet Cong and the NVA could no longer hide. Uh, and I guess to some degree it was effective, but it killed all plants. It wasn't just like killing this jungle. It killed farms, plants, weeds, whatever else. And it was highly, highly toxic. And many of our own people died uh, as a result of it being sprayed over soldiers as they were in the jungles searching for Vietnamese, as well as the fact this caused horrible, horrible birth defects. Um, ultimately, today, we're still technically fighting the Vietnam War because we're dealing with the after effects of the use of Agent Orange. But many of the babies that were born <coughs> that were affected by Agent Orange, uh, because maybe their mothers ingested it because it was on the plants, they breathed it in, they drank the water. Uh, many of these babies were born without arms, legs. Some of them were born without skin. Some of them were born without eyes or a mouth or a nose or a face. I mean, some of them were just born completely deformed. Uh, maybe, you know, their legs were uh, unusable. Maybe they were born with, you know, one lung. I mean, it was just really, really bad stuff. And so even today, people are still having to deal with the after effects of Agent Orange. Um, and that's pretty terrible. The other tool that we used is napalm or an incendiary. Napalm is like being able to throw fire at people. I don't know if you guys know this, but you can't just pick up fire. You can. Have you ever picked up fire before? I bet you haven't. You maybe like light a stick and throw that, but that's not the same thing. Agent Orange, or uh, sorry, napalm, uh, gave us the ability to kind of throw fire at people. Pretty much it was a liquid that burned really, really hot, and it was sticky also. It's like sticky fire. So you can like throw it and it'll just burn that thing. Um, and so napalm created walls of fire throughout Vietnam. We burned down forests. And the unfortunate thing about napalm is if you got it on you, like they sprayed you with napalm because you were like a soldier, um, you couldn't just put it out with water. You had to like wait for that fuel to burn out before you'd be able to put it out. So uh, not good. And we killed a lot of people in horrible ways through napalm as well. Good? All right. Well, the Tet Offensive in 1968. Here's what happened. In 1968, folks, North Vietnam and South Vietnam signed a two-day truce. They agreed to a two-day truce on Tet. North Vietnam and South Vietnam agreed to a truce on Tet. It was a two-day truce on Tet. Tet is what? Does anyone know what Tet is? It's the Lunar New Year. It's the Lunar New Year. You guys don't like Chinese New Year? Well, it's not just the Chinese that celebrate it. You know, Cambodians, Laotians, uh, the Vietnamese celebrate it also. So it was the Lunar New Year is what they were celebrating. And so what happened uh, is that they say, hey, everyone wants to celebrate this. Let's declare a truce. It's a ceasefire. No one shoots for two days. Everyone was like, okay, that's cool. America was like, that's fine. At the same time, America pledged that victory was within reach. America pledged that their victory would be within reach, that we were just within reach of winning this war in Vietnam. Make sense to everyone so far? We pledged that victory was within reach. We pledged that victory was within reach. And then, on the day of Tet, the Viet Cong launched a surprise invasion. The Viet Cong began a surprise invasion of South Vietnam. 67,000 VC attacked over 100 cities simultaneously. Were we prepared for this? No, this was a complete surprise attack. We assumed they weren't going to do this because they said they wouldn't. And so the VC launched a surprise attack across 100 cities across South Vietnam. 67,000 Viet Cong rose up and attacked the cities. Cities that we believed to be impenetrable were penetrated. 
the U.S. Embassy was taken over. Saigon, the, me- the capital of South Vietnam, all the way down to South Vietnam, Viet Cong were taking over these cities. As far down as Quan Long, they were attacking. And so we thought, holy crap, and we, this came as a huge surprise for us. The entire Tet Offensive, or the entire conflict, was televised. The entire conflict was televised on American news. And so the Americans saw this, and what did they think? America saw us losing the war. And the reason why this changed, this is the turning point of the war, folks. The Tet Offensive becomes the turning point of the war after it's televised. Because after the Americans see what's happening in Vietnam, their opinion changes and they believe that the war is unwinnable. We can't win this. Look! You said we were winning and all of a sudden on one day we lose over a hundred cities? Are you kidding me? This is winning for us? So it changed public opinion and it made Americans realize that this war was unwinnable. We just couldn't win this war and they wanted to pull out. Now here's the interesting thing, folks. Ultimately, the Tet Offensive failed. Because the Americans and the South Vietnamese, they pushed the Viet Cong back. They, they uh, saved all these cities. So the Tet Offensive was a military failure. But what kind of success was it? It's a media success or a propaganda success for North Vietnam. It's a military failure. But it was a media or propaganda success. Because did it change the minds of the American people? They are no longer going to support this war. And that changes everything. Because if you can't get your people to support a war, you're not going to be able to keep fighting it for very long. Good? So the anti-war movement becomes uh, pretty prominent because of the Tet Offensive. Hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? What kids are they talking about? Which kids? The, uh, the, the drafted kids, yeah, the, the draftees, the, the young American soldiers, and also the Vietnamese children that were killing. So uh, they're talking about both the draftees and you know, the, the young Americans being killed as well as the Vietnamese. So they're just protesting the war, saying we're killing too many people, not just our own, but theirs as well. Because of the unpopular press and the frustrations that everyone had with Johnson, Johnson decides to not seek another term. He says, I have decided that I shall not seek and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. They're like, oh, okay. So there are two cartoons here that will illustrate the point. First is this one. There are two Johnsons. The first President Johnson has a shirt that reads what? What does this one read? Great Society. And he's climbing up a mountain. And he's tied by a rope to this Johnson right here. What does that sign read? Foreign Policy. So who can raise their hand and tell me what is suggested by this cartoon? What is being suggested by this cartoon here? Carla. Correct. What's being implied by this cartoon is something you guys should all write down, is that the successes of the great society were overshadowed by the failures of Vietnam. So the successes of the great society were overshadowed by the failures in Vietnam. Does that make sense to everyone? Successes of the great society were overshadowed by the failures of Vietnam. And then in the other cartoon, here's Johnson again in the middle, and he has two mistresses. One, he has this Vietnam War mistress, and uh, it says Vietnam War here. Here's again Johnson. And here's a Vietnam War mistress with her uh, coat. Uh, and then there's this uh, mistress here who says U.S. Urban Needs. So if you look at both of these here, uh, Johnson says there's money enough to support both of you. Now, doesn't that make you feel better? But what is being suggested? Sure, we're giving money to both, but who are we giving more money to? The Vietnam War. So the idea is Johnson had these two mistresses, Vietnam and the needs of the people. Who is he giving more money to? 
Vietnam. So the suggestion also is that the great society failed because money was used for the Vietnam War. So the great society also failed because money was diverted to the Vietnam War. Cool. Last thing today. So in the election of 1968, is Johnson going to run? No, he's not. So the Democrats now have to choose someone. And so in the Democratic primary, where they have to choose their candidate for the presidency, the Democrats have two leading candidates, Robert F. Kennedy and Hubert Humphrey. Now, whoever wins this de uh, Democratic primary, does that mean that person is going to be president of the United States? It means they're going to be what? the Democratic candidates. I want to make that clear. In the election of 1968, there are two candidates that are trying to be the Democratic nominee. There's actually three, but we're not going to talk about Eugene McCarthy. Robert F. Kennedy and Hubert Humphrey. Robert F. Kennedy is the popular one. He's likely going to win, and he's going to run against Nixon, and they believe that if Kennedy runs against Nixon, he'll be able to defeat him again, Okay, which means that Kennedy would have been defeated by both brothers. Kennedy is a man of the people. Uh, he's very well loved. He's pro civil rights. He's for the poor. You know, even though he's wealthy, he in and of himself, he's 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 an everybody's man. He's an every person's man, um, and he really would have changed America. He really was a person that believed that America deserved change and violence was not the answer. Robert F. Robert F. Kennedy in uh, nineteen oh what year is this? I don't know the exact year. In 1968, uh, Robert F. Kennedy wins the California primary. So not too far away. Ambassador Hotel is no longer there. He wins the California primary, and it's expected that he's going to win the Democratic nomination, because California is one of the biggest states. He's, he wins the California primary. And on that night, he decides, no Americans, we won the California primary. Let's move on to Chicago, and we'll win there, too. And he begins to shake hands of all his, you know, his, uh, his supporters there at the ambassador ballroom. He starts shaking people's hands, you know, black, white, Latino, you know, Asian, you know, young, old, uh, men, women, just shaking everyone's hands, you know, the rich. He's also shaking the, the heat, and he exits through the kitchen. He starts shaking the hands of all the kitchen workers in there who've been, you know, holding the party for the Democratic uh, convention. Uh, and he's shaking their hands. As he's shaking their hands, a man walks up to him with a gun, and he shoots him square in the chest. Robert F. Kennedy dies right there, and he's assassinated by a man named Sirhan Sirhan. So much like his brother, he was also assassinated. Sirhan Sirhan assassinates Robert F. Kennedy right there in the kitchen of the Ambassador Hotel. Which is really unfortunate, because I really wanted him to be the next President of the United States. Sirhan Sirhan, in case you guys are curious, killed him uh, due to Middle Eastern conflicts. Uh, pretty much Sirhan Sirhan did not like the fact that Robert F. Kennedy supported Israel, and so he assassinated him for it. Um, Robert F. Kennedy is killed, and therefore Hubert Humphrey will become the candidate for the presidency. Uh, we're going to end today with a speech by Robert F. Kennedy that he gave uh, several years ago. Um, to kind of give you an idea of who this guy is, we don't really talk too much about Robert F. Kennedy, but he is my personal favorite historical figure, and so I think he deserves the next seven minutes. So go ahead, and, uh, we're going to listen to his speech and uh, just pay attention, listen to his words, and kind of imagine if this man had become president, how much different the